In this video, we're going to be making this the most beautiful, gorgeous, and stunning modern UI that you've ever laid your eyes upon. Okay, I get it. Maybe it's not the eye candy you were hoping for. But the point of this series is to make a minimum viable product that demonstrates how to link a Python project with a licensing server and a payment processor. So with the core functionality of our project working, now it's time to start building out our interface so other people can interact with our program using a mouse and keyboard. We have a lot to cover in this video, so buckle your seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Firstly, if you haven't already done so, start by adding the line shown to your settings.json file. This line ensures that our terminal always opens in the root directory of our workspace, preventing issues such as the creation of multiple unwanted virtual environments. Next we'll add a config.py file to our project module. In here we'll create a debug constant which is set to true. This file is extremely useful for housing variables that you want to share between different submodules in your project. And you can import variables from config.py into submodules using an import statement resembling the following form. We'll see an example of this shortly. Now switch over to the main.py file in our source directory. The ultimate purpose of this file is to serve as an external entry point into our project module, which is necessary for PyInstaller to work correctly. However, we also want to keep code in this file to a minimum, as it will not be obfuscated during the compilation process. This means that any code we write here could be easily recovered by an end user if they choose to decompile our executable. I'll be showing you how to decompile a Python executable for testing purposes later in this series. And if this is something you want to see, let me know by hitting the like button. Continuing along, we're going to import the run function from an entry point submodule that we'll be creating shortly, and executing it if the main.py file is run as a script, just as we configured in our launch.json configs earlier in the series. Next we create an entry point.py file in the Terra module. Here we import sys, the debug variable from the config file we created earlier, as well as an app class from a submodule we'll be creating shortly. Afterwards, we configure our program to disable stack traces if the debug variable is set to false, allowing us to control whether tracebacks are visible during development or hidden in production. We then write up the run method, which creates an instance of the app class and executes the main loop function. Great. Now there's just a little bit left before we get our first glimpse of the UI library we'll be working with. Create a folder named GUI, or lowercase, inside the Terra directory, and then create an app.py file inside this folder. Here we import custom to Kinter as CTK for brevity, as well as a scaling tracker class which allows us to account for Windows UI scaling to ensure consistent window sizes irrespective of display settings. We then set the application's default appearance to dark, and set the default theme to blue. You can read more about the options available in the custom to Kinter wiki, links in the description. If we now write up a brief definition for the app class, which inherits from the ctk.ctk class, we can now switch over to the debug pane, select the main app configuration, and hit run. You should now see a little window pop up on your screen that resembles the window shown in the bottom right. Congratulations! You've just made your first UI app. To make things a little less jank, let's start by setting the title for our application. We then configure the geometry of the window by determining the current display scaling factor, which we use together with our desired width and height, to calculate an x and y offset for the window produced. The goal of these calculations is to center the window on our primary monitor every time the app launches. Be careful when writing this code though, as all numbers used in the geometry string need to be integers. Use of floating point values will cause the geometry call to fail. We then disable resizing as it's just not necessary to account for window size changes in this particular app. The next step is configuring the grid for our application. You'll need to do this on every app, top level window or frame you create if you want a specific row and or column to expand to the limits of its container. This is an essential step if you're making your app resizable. This specific configuration sets the weight of row 0 and column 0, that is the first row and first column of our app window, to 1. This means that any widget we now place in row 0 will expand vertically to take up any residual space, and similarly, widgets placed in column 0 will expand horizontally to take up residual space. The only widget we're going to add to the main app window is the split frame widget, which we're now going to create. First import the widget from the GUI frame split submodule, then create an instance and position it in row 0, column 0. The sticky argument will expand the widget to fill its grid cell. The next step is creating a frames folder in the GUI directory, where we'll then create a split.py file. Separating the different components of your app into frame widgets is really useful for organizing your code and making it easier to maintain moving forward. In this file, we'll first import custom to Kinter, several typing classes, as well as the app submodule from our project. We need to import the app submodule instead of the app class, as importing the app class directly would create a circular import and a whole lot of grief. We then create a split frame class, which inherits from CTK frame. If we now start writing the definition for the init function, and select the autocomplete suggestion, VS Code will automatically generate all the parameters required for 
the function in Supercall. If we now save the file, which causes the black formatter to run, the code generated looks a whole lot more digestible. The only change we're going to make here is setting the corner radius to zero by default, as this ensures our frame fills the whole app window. Next, while this line doesn't necessarily have any practical use in our application, it's extremely useful to bind the root application to the app variable of a widget, so that you can access any other frame, widget, or window in your application using dot notation. For example, if you had another widget named merge frame bound to the root application like so, you could then reference it in split frame using the following variable. After this, we can figure our grid and start creating our interface widgets. First, we have a label widget which places text in a specific grid position. We use padding to space the text from the edges of the frame and use sticky with value w for west to position it to the left side of its grid cell. We then create another label with some placeholder text and a lighter background to display the current value of the input file path. Using sticky with value we stretches this label across its entire cell as earlier we set column 1 to have a weight of 1, causing it to take up any remaining space in the window. The last element in the first row is a button, which users should click to browse for the input file path. We then repeat these elements in a similar fashion on row 1 for the output directory. Lastly, we add an action button in row 2, which has a column span of 3 so it spans all the columns we've created so far, and set sticky to we so it spans the whole app window. If you debug the app now, this is what you'll see. With the main interface done, we now want to add a simple pop-up window for handling the activation process. Create a folder named top level levels in the GUI directory, and then create a file named activate.py. Start off with the required import statements, and then define the activate top level class which inherits from ctk top level. When you start typing the init function definition, use the autocomplete suggestion, just like before. Here we add extra parameters for width and height, and set default values to make our activation window adjustable if necessary down the line. We then follow a similar process to our main app, setting a title, sizing and positioning the window, and configuring the grid. We then create a label and entry text field where users can type in their license key. This is followed by an activate button and lastly a call to grab set which prevents the main app window from being used while the activate window is open. You can test this activation window out by importing it and calling it from within the main app like so. In the previous section we said we'd use pop-up alerts instead of raising errors during the error handling process. So to do this, we'll create an alert.py file in the top levels folder, follow the same initial procedures we just used to begin defining the alert top level class, and then add in extra parameters for title, text, button text, width and height. We then set our window title, update the size and position of the window, as well as configure the grid. After this, we add a label to display our message and a close button for dismissing our alert. If you find that your message is too long to fit inside the window, you can adjust the window size when you instantiate the alert top level class using the width and height arguments. Lastly, we use grab set to prevent app usage while the alert is present. Just like before, you can test this alert window out by instantiating it within our main app class. We're almost there. The last thing we're going to add is a menu so that we can access basic functionality from the top bar of our app. To do this, we create a menu.py file in the GUI directory of our app, and then import both custom tokenta and tokenta. Then define the menu class, which accepts a master parameter in its init function. We then bind this object to the master instance variable, set the default font size to 12, and create a menu bar object. We can now begin defining the file dropdown menu, which will have an input file option, output directory option, menu separator, and exit option. We also add a help dropdown menu, which only contains an option to activate our application. The final step in constructing our GUI is adding this menu to our application. Open up app.py, import the menu class, and bind it to the menu attribute like so. It's worth mentioning that when we created these menus, we used tearoff equals zero to prevent a dotted line from appearing at the top of our dropdowns, and we also used underline values to determine the letter users can press to navigate the menu after pressing the Alt key. This is what it looks like when you press the Alt key and then F key. If I wanted to start browsing for an input file, you would now press I. And we're done. We've now finished creating all the GUI elements for our application. One small problem though. If you try clicking any of the buttons, they don't do anything. So that's exactly what we're going to be fixing in the next part of the series. If you found this video useful and want more content just like this, consider subscribing. And if you're ready to start integrating our UI with the core functionality of our app, click the video on the left. Until next time.